what I'm going to talk about, which is business cycle measurement, business cycle indicators, uh, and, and why the conference board uh, does this. Um, <clears throat> So in the economics program, uh, we have three basic pillars. Short-term uh, forecasting is one of those, so that's where the indicators work uh, comes in. Um, and then there's also uh, medium and long-term outlook uh, that looks at uh, longer-term issues, potential growth, uh, and comparison across uh, international uh, economies. Um, <clears throat> And uh, there we look at issues about uh, intangible investment, intangible capital, human capital, uh, which, is, uh, which came up as one of the important uh, elements in, in the growth uh, theory um, on the first day. Uh, and there's another component that looks at how you apply these, uh, the, the, the knowledge that we get from uh, economics uh, into business planning. So how do businesses kind of turn this knowledge into uh, economic decision making uh, to help, uh, help their performance? Okay. Um, so today um, I'm going to talk to you about the business cycle indicators approach. Um, and um, the first part is going to be an overview, uh, hopefully quick, uh, and then I'm going to show you some examples from emerging markets. Uh, we publish a leading economic index for China, and we're getting ready to uh, publish uh, similar indexes for uh, India and Brazil. And so I'd like to show you some examples there um, and uh, uh, talk about you know, what we're learning from, from this type of measurement. Um, and uh, the, the, the basic challenge uh, that we hear from our members uh, is um, they want timely information about where the economy is going. So the quarterly figures you get on GDP or the annual numbers that you get uh, that you know, policy mem uh, policymakers use to determine sort of uh, structural policy um, is not really granular enough. So they need uh, up-to-date, high-frequency uh, data uh, to understand the direction of the economy. Uh, and um, you know, there are a lot of indicators. Um, they measure different aspects of economy. They're not always directly related to one another. They may be correlated or not. But, uh, you know, everybody has their favorite indicator, uh, so you could kind of have endless debates about which one should have the most weight, which one you should use in your forecast or not. The approach that I'm going to tell you about the business cycle indicators provides a systematic framework to organize all of these indicators uh, into um, uh, a, a disciplined way to, to think about uh, all these different indicators and then summarize them in a way that uh, can teach us about business cycle movements. Uh, so it's, it's highly empirical, it's very pragmatic, uh, and it really relies on um, uh, learning from the history and then applying those uh, learnings to uh, the future in the current analysis. Um, and uh, a couple of um, points that I wanted to talk about already came up in, uh, in earlier uh, uh, sessions. Um, the consistency of data and comparability is really important in this work. Uh, so one of our goals is to uh, take the, uh, the, the work that's been developed for the U.S. Uh, over decades in the leading economic index and uh, apply it to other economies in a way that makes them all comparable. Uh, and that consistency and comparability uh, can then help us to uh, ask questions about uh, a global business cycle or our regional and global cycles interacting and how they're interacting. So um, hopefully you'll see that the, the measures that we develop uh, can be helpful to uh, understand these forces and do, do some analysis uh, on this. Um, so, I mentioned that the conference board has a long history, almost 100 years, uh, but the, the adventure with the leading indicators started in the mid-90s. Uh, the U.S. government decided to privatize the program on uh, the leading economic index, uh, and the conference board was chosen to take this over. Uh, and since then, we um, 
we make monthly uh, regular publications, press releases on the US LEI. We maintain the underlying database. Um, and we've expanded this, uh, this, this approach to now 11 countries uh, with India and Brazil uh, uh, on the way. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, they're all uh, applying the approach uh, that uh, the US LEI is built on. So there is a, uh, an inherent comparability in uh, the selection of components that go into the indexes. Um, and uh, they all use the same methodology. Uh, and uh, the methodology is not driven by uh, regression analysis. So it's really measurement uh, uh, driven. Um, now, even though um, so we're applying the same approach, every country is a little bit different. Uh, so we do, uh, we have to make allowances for uh, idiosyncratic uh, structural differences from country to country. Um, and the, uh, the statistical systems in each country also uh, force you to, to, to do that because um, the, the same series are not available in all countries. Um, and even sometimes when it looks like uh, they're available, when you look under the hood, there are differences in definitions, methodologies. Uh, so uh, industrial production in the US is not the same as industrial production in China. So uh, you have to go through this uh, in-depth analysis before you can uh, get to these indexes to put them on, a, uh, on an equal footing. Um, so this is just a, a teaser, or um, it's like the, uh, the dessert, which uh, you've already had lunch, so you can have another dessert. Uh, these are the leading economic indexes for three major uh, economies. Uh, the chart shows the six-month growth rate of the indexes. Um, and uh, the historical experience uh, and following them month to month shows that they track the uh, global, uh, um, uh, well, the, the, the cycle in each country and then the, also the global sort of economic conditions. So you see uh, the Euro area and the US uh, started to fall and then show the big contraction. China was kind of doing its own thing and you know, it's on a different planet uh, because its, its growth trend is really dominating what's going on, but it is experiencing its own fluctuations. And here you see uh, people are referring to these um, early in the year declines in the LEI, and you see in other indicators the spring swoons in the US. So in the past three years or so, there's this uh, swoon at the beginning of the year uh, we, when activity starts to show some, uh, uh, some imbalances and a risk of a rising downturn, but then it goes away. So. already talked about expanding the indicators. Um, so today, I'm actually not going to talk a lot about the leading indicators. Uh, I'll spend uh, much more on the coincident indicators, which is the, uh, the keystone of the whole approach, actually, uh, because the coincident indicators tell you where the economy is, what the current conditions are in the, in the economy. Um, and they're monthly indicators, so there's a, a, a higher resolution of uh, knowing that state of the economy. And the coincident indicators then are the, the target of the leading indicators. So we have to have the coincident index to evaluate the leading indicators that go into the composite index. So uh, before I can get to this picture, I have to look at uh, where the major expansions and contractions in the economy are, and that's what the coincident indicators tell us. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the approach goes back to the seminal work of Burns and Mitchell um, at the NBER and, uh, and following that at the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, <clears throat> And uh, even though the earliest writings are from 1927, you know, people were talking about this concept of a business cycle much well before then. The economic measurement wasn't there to really understand what was going on. And Burns and Mitchell really codified the idea of uh, business cycle timing. Um, how do we uh, classify uh, business cycle expansions and contractions? How do we uh, 
uh, assign uh, uh, a timing a reference to each indicator uh, to put them in this kind of uh, classification system. And the core of that definition is that the, the economy goes through these sequences of ups and downs, as you know, business cycles, uh, that, uh, uh, that affects all macroeconomic indicators. Uh, and there's kind of an um, unseen variable, business cycle variable, that represents this co-movement. Uh, so that's really kind of the seminal definition of uh, business cycles. Um, <clears throat> Of course, there are a lot of uh, theories about business cycles. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, and uh, it's just to show you that, uh, obviously, this is a huge area. You've already, um, in these two days, heard about different theories. There's uh, often not a, a whole unifying theory of, um, of business cycles that everyone agrees on. So the approach we're taking is much more uh, pragmatic. It, uh, it, it can allow you to bring in different theories under one roof in these indexes. Uh, so it's a very empirical uh, measurement-oriented approach. Um, <clears throat> um, so once we've classified the different indicators, we summarize them in composite indexes, which is an estimate of this co-moving uh, co-movement variable. Um, and uh, the coincident indicators tell us where the economy is, current conditions, and then the leading indicators move a ahead of these uh, indica uh, coincident indicators. They help us to predict uh, where the coincident, uh, coincident ind index is going to go. Um, and the hardest thing in forecasting is forecasting turning points. And these Composite indexes uh, may be one of the best tools that we have to understand when the economy is near a turning point and to be able to predict those. Um, so um, often around turning points, there's a lot of disagreement. You get mixed signals. Uh, so the indexes are not immune to that, but they give you a systematic and standard way to, to analyze the information that's, that's filtering through indicators and uh, have a more disciplined way to have the conversation about what those uh, signals are and you know, how, how important they are. Um, okay. And uh, in the US, we also have lagging indicators, which historically will confirm the movement. Uh, but we haven't extended that in the other uh, economies because the, the, the majority of the attention goes to leading indicators, as you can imagine. You know, can we forecast and predict wh what's going to happen? Uh, then it's coincident indicators, uh, which maybe as economists we think um, are the more, more important um, because it's hard enough to know where we are right now. Um, okay. um, just a couple of points of terminology so we're on the same page. Um, uh, an indicator is a time series variable. An index is a composite. So it's a kind of a weighted average of these indicators. Um, I'll talk about LEI and CEI, uh, the leading economic index and the coincident economic index. Uh, and these are, type, these are types of indexes that are uh, under diffusion indexes. Uh, they attempt to measure how widespread uh, a certain movement is across many indicators. So you're trying to get at the idea that many indicators are showing the same sequence of movements around the same time. So this idea of diffusion and how widespread that movement is uh, helpful in assessing and analyzing uh, 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 the direction of the economy. <clears throat> um, and uh, as I show the examples, uh, uh, I'm going to talk uh, about trend and cycle. Um, and uh, the trends are long-term, slow movements. Uh, they're usually associated with structural changes in the economy. And the cycle is a short-term, temporary movement. Um, Burns and Mitchell were focused on something called trend cycle. They, they weren't interested in decomposing trend and cycle, as far as I can tell. Um, I think there may have been a couple of good reasons for it. Um, you know, they didn't have the econometric technology. Uh, they didn't have the computing technology to do that uh, for a lot of series. 
Um, but also, I think uh, they, they recognize or acknowledge that um, it's a difficult problem to tackle. Um, and now you click a button and you get the trend cycle decomposition. Many programs have these already uh, packaged. Um, but when you really think about what goes under the, the estimation, there are certain assumptions in the regressions you run. Um, and uh, those assumptions, um, you know, may create debate and de detract from the actual uh, uh, purpose of the, the indicators. Um, and uh, so the trend cycle gives you a measure of the business cycle. So business cycle occurs in the levels of economic activity, the level of employment, level of GDP. Um, and a companion or complementary concept that was developed by NBER researcher was this idea of growth cycle, which is a cycle in deviations from trend. Um, so. Um, I think they're complementary concepts, but they're easily confused. Um, so uh, I try to be very careful about uh, what I reference when I talk about business cycles and uh, growth cycles. Um, okay. So uh, just a quick idealized picture of what a business cycle looks like. You're all very familiar with this. Uh, what we're concerned with are the uh, turning points in the business cycle, the peaks and the troughs. Uh, which are really hard to predict, right? Um, if you could predict them, you could really, well, you could make a lot of money in the stock market, but you can also make money for your business because you can adjust your uh, workforce levels um, better than your comp competitors. Uh, you can adjust your inventory levels, so uh, you reduce the cost of business cycles on your operations. Um, so if you take trend away from the level, then you would be left with the, uh, still fluctuations and deviations from trend, and those are what's, what are called the growth cycles. Um, um, and uh, the story with growth cycles is, you know, MBER researchers were um, very focused on business cycles, but then in the post-World War II era, there were these very long expansions in Europe, you know, catching up after the World War uh, uh, destruction and they weren't observing the business cycles that they were used to observing. But once the trend was removed, then you could start to uh, observe these uh, fluctuations and they do have some regularity to them. Um, but they have different characteristics, they tend to be more symmetric and so on. Um, so uh, this kind of defines the, the, the language that uh, the indicators approach speaks. Um, So, uh, also one of the major features of the approach uh, is to select a small set of indicators to estimate the, the common factor. Uh, so it looks at a very large universe of indicators that are available uh, and applies some selection criteria um, and narrows it down to a handful. That handful helps you to estimate the composite index, which is an estimate of that common factor, um, through a very simple and uh, transparent method. Um, and um, it gives you a good representation of the business cycle. Um, there is recent uh, literature, uh, uh, some of it done by Stock and Watson, that looks at uh, extracting that factor from very large uh, uh, data sets. Um, and um, so there are advantages to that also. Um, and um, this approach of narrowing it down to a small set seems to work uh, almost as well. So um, it, it's a parallel approach. Um, for us, the, uh, the advantage is um, it's very easy to pinpoint where a certain decline in the indexes is coming from. Uh, so you can trace it back through the components and um, uh, you can also talk about uh, you know, how widespread it is across compo components um, in, in, in a more straightforward way you know, uh, when we talk to the business audience. Um, okay. Um, okay. So um, while uh, this audience is probably familiar with the 
Bryan-Boshan algorithm, which came up uh, already. So that's the, the, the way to select the major uh, turning points. Uh, it's basically applying uh, a filter to the turning points uh, to, that establish the characteristics or features of what we think of our business cycles. Uh, so these the, the filter uh, uh, puts restrictions on the length of a phase in the business cycle uh, and the distance in time between a peak and a trough and so on. Um, so we've already talked about that. So. Um, Okay, there, there is a very long uh, uh, history about the whole approach. Um, uh, and if you're interested, you can refer back to, back to these uh, earlier writings. Um, and uh, some of the newer papers that we've worked on are on our website, so, or I can send them to you if you're interested on, uh, uh, on how we apply the approach. Um, okay. So um, I'm rushing ahead because I do want to get to the examples. Um, I think we've already covered most of this. Uh, again, we're really focused on the turning points and we're summarizing those turning points in many indicators using the composite indexes. Um, we do spend a lot of time on the selection part of the process, uh, looking at each individual indicator uh, individually to, uh, to see whether they pass the criteria uh, and the criteria are based on uh, things like, you know, are, are they published regularly? Are they going to be timely? Are they high frequency? There's a preference for monthly indicators. Um, is the statistical survey uh, that's underlying that indicator is sound and robust? Um, you know, we ask questions about, you know, is the sample size large enough? Is it appropriate? Is it well regarded by forecasters uh, in, in the economy, in the local economy? Um, and once we have a, um, well, in the process of that, we also um, focus on seasonally adjusted data because the seasonality has to be removed before you can uh, reliably see the uh, business cycle. Um, we focus on uh, inflation adjustments, the real variables. Um, and the index calculation is very straightforward. Um, each indicator goes through a volatility adjustment uh, that standardizes or in a way it normalizes the indicator um, and then the monthly changes the monthly growth rate of the indicator is averaged together with the, the small set to give you the index number it, the monthly change in the index which is then recursively uh, um, added up so accumulated you get the level of the index um, and uh, it's a fixed base index. Uh, currently, we use 2004 equals 100. Um, and um, so once we've, we've calculated these indexes and we've developed them, we ask whether they're helpful in forecasting. So we build in uh, kind of an out-of-sample uh, forecasting test into our development process uh, so that we're not just looking at the historical description of the, the economy. Uh, which is very easy to do with picking the right indicators. But we go through out-of-sample forecasting uh, so that uh, we can be more comfortable that they're going to be helpful going forward. Uh, okay. So um, in the U.S., the NBER committee looks at four indicators to determine the, um, well, four indicators and GDP and uh, Mark will correct me if I'm wrong, but those are the main ones uh, that, that tell you the current conditions of the economy. Uh, so employment, industrial production, personal income, and manufacturing and trade sales. So this is the model for all the other coincident indicators uh, where possible, but you'll see we have to be a little bit uh, creative. Um, and uh, I think the idea behind the coincident indicators uh, goes to the circular flow. There is this flow between households and firms, um, and the, the indicators, the four indicators, really try to uh, pick those. Uh, so if everything is growing on a balanced path, uh, there's no problem in the economy. But if it kind of, it's ri like riding a bike, if, uh, if, it's, if one side is out of kilter, then it's going to create a source of imbalance in the economy, uh, and that could really uh, grow into a bigger uh, issue for the economy and create a, a business cycle. Um, how much time do I have? 15? 
Um, so this is also key. The coincident indicators uh, represent a broader um, measure of the economy. So it's multivariate. It's not relying just on output or income, but it's, re it's looking at uh, sales activity and employment activity. Uh, generally, this is a hypothesis. There is less revision in, coincident, uh, in the coincident index than in GDP. GDP can be revised for long strings. Uh, when BEA comes out, sometimes you get uh, revisions for the whole history or, or the last three years, which can be substantial. It can change turning points. One of the reasons why the MBER committee waits so long before, uh, before they announce uh, the, the peaks or troughs. Um, and it's, it's our uh, target variable on a monthly frequency for the leading indicators. Uh, that's what it looks like for the U.S. There's a nice long history. It's gone through uh, seven or eight uh, recessions. Um, and the index matches very well with those recession dates. Uh, so it's a good guide for understanding major contractions. The shaded areas are the uh, recessions the contractions in the coincident uh, index and the uh, NBER. Um, the coincident indicators are obviously highly correlated with GDP. It's no surprise. Um, so that gives us a, a point of comparison in other countries where we build coincident indicators. Um, but one thing to point out is that we're uh, not going through a curve-fitting exercise to get at these indicators. So it's really driven by the ideas about business cycles. So there's no regression behind this that'll, that'll maximize the fit of the coincident index to GDP or anything else like that. Uh, same thing for the leading indicators. Um, okay. Um, so for China, um, we've been publishing a leading index and a coincident index since uh, 2010. Um, and we went through the selection process and picked five indicators for the coincident and um, six indicators for the leading. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, if you're interested, you can look at our working papers. Uh, the, uh, the, the first one has been published in the China Economic Journal. Um, now, you'll see that the industrial production, industrial gross value added, and retail sales are similar to the US. Manufacturing employment is a narrower measure of employment, so it's not the ideal measure. Uh, but out of the uh, two or three different employment measures, that turned out to be uh, uh, the, the, the more appropriate one to use. Um, and then we have these things called electricity production and passenger traffic, which are unusual to see in coincident indicators. But when you compare their uh, cyclical movements with the other indicators and with the index, you, uh, you see the same kind of sequences. Um, uh, so uh, given the statistical system, uh, you have to be a little bit creative in these uh, economies. Um, but there are a lot of problems with the measurement of uh, uh, national accounts uh, and uh, other economic indicators in, in China. Um, I have uh, a paper with Harry Wu, who knows a lot about national income uh, accounts in, uh, in China, uh, on trying to assess how much of a bias these problems with the uh, uh, measurement in China is creating for the indexes. But let me go ahead and show you uh, what these indexes look like. Um, <clears throat> the red line is the uh, coincident economic index. And based on that, we're able to identify a major recession period in 88-89. Uh, um, and we only bring, it, bring the indexes back to 1986 based on the available data and also the transformation that China is going, uh, has been going through. Um, so before 1986, you don't have the same kind of comparable data, but also the economy is very different. Uh, you can't really talk about business cycles at that time. But uh, starting since then, we were able to identify uh, the, the, um, the major contraction. And it seems to be in line with the, uh, the huge growth trend that uh, China has experienced since then. And we do see some slowdowns. Uh, at periods where you, you know, we show this to uh, Chinese economists and they, they think it's a realistic description of the, the, the economy. Uh, so this 
for, for Chinese economists is um, the Tiananmen Square uh, event. Uh, it's not necessarily seen as an uh, economic event. Uh, however, I would point out that in the leading indicator, you have a peak that precedes it. So to me, that suggests that there was something in the economy uh, that was going on. Um, and when you probe deeper, there was kind of a high inflation area and, there, uh, and government policy was trying to combat that. Um, now, um, of course, you can't see the cycle there, but um, in growth rates, uh, you can see it better. And comparing it to GDP uh, growth, you, you see a pretty close correspondence. So there are some areas uh, which are off, um, and we're looking into why that might be. Is it because of biases or some kind of smoothing in GDP or not? So these indexes kind of give us an alternative measure for the economy and help us to ask and frame questions about the quality of GDP uh, statistics. Um, <clears throat> so in order to see um, the growth cycle, we estimate a trend, um, and uh, thanks to uh, Professor Prescott, uh, we use the Hadrick Prescott trend to, to estimate what the trend looks like. But for monthly uh, frequency, there's a paper by Han and Ulick that re recommends a higher smoothing parameter, so that's why the trend looks smoother. And once you take that trend out, you see regular uh, intervals of movements, uh, up and down movements. Um, and so that's, that chronology is also helpful for identifying major periods of slowdowns uh, for, for China. Okay. Um, and if we go through the same exercise for the LEI, detrended, and compare the detrended uh, uh, turning points, uh, we do see that on average there is a lead from the leading indicators to the detrended coincident indicators. Um, so it can be a useful tool for picking out, predicting those turning points. Okay. So I do want to show you uh, the examples from uh, India and Brazil. I won't have time to go into them. I have about done. Or, okay. Let me just quickly run through it. Um, in, in India, the coincident index looks like this. Uh, in that case, the recession period corresponds to more of a global event. Um, and ever since the reform started there, they have a very high growth. Um, there's a period here which is kind of under question right now. Um, so that's why we call this an experimental index. Um, and uh, OK, so. Uh, so to look at the reliability of you know, these turning points for this, uh, we did an exercise where we combined the index with GDP. And uh, it turns out that it doesn't really make a difference for uh, the identification of the turning point. Uh, and for India, we also look at non-agricultural GDP uh, because even though agriculture is not a huge part of the Indian economy anymore, it is uh, influenced a lot by the monsoon cycle and so it could have an impact on uh, the, uh, the movements that you see for GDP may be related more to the monsoon than for the underlying economic uh, factors. So that was one exercise that we did. But the turning points, um, at least the two that we could pick out with uh, Brai Boshan, uh, are robust to that. Okay. So the same exercise with the uh, deviations from trend uh, give you a more visible picture of the the, the, the cycle. Okay. Um, and then a comparison with uh, India and China suggests that there may be some synchronization going on. So comparing the, the dates of the growth cycles for two countries, uh, post-2000, there is more of a correspondence with, between the two uh, economies. Uh, and then, you know, you can take these measures uh, and uh, somebody asked about projects for students. You can kind of see if uh, these measures help you to answer questions like this. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, so uh, I'll leave with the, uh, the indicators for Brazil, uh, which is based on some work that uh, we're doing with uh, uh, at FGV Ibre, um, Aloysio Campello, 
uh, Paula Piketty and uh, Sarah Lima. Uh, some of them are in the audience. Um, applying the same approach as the U.S., trying to pick out those four indicators, we come actually pretty close. Uh, the statistics uh, are better than other emerging uh, economies, but there are some discontinued series, um, and uh, you have to go move from an old definition to a new definition and so on. Um, but with that basic definition, um, we constructed an experimental CEI for Brazil. Um, and uh, encouragingly, uh, these are the turning points for this CEI, but they also correspond to the CODASE dates, which are the dates that come from the, the Business Cycle Dating Committee for Brazil, in Brazil. So this, these are the consensus dates for, uh, for Brazil uh, by Brazilian economists. Uh, so this is very similar to what we're used to seeing in the US and other countries, uh, so it's very encouraging. Uh, Here is another version of the experimental uh, index. Uh, I don't think I have time to go into why it's different, but it just has a couple of additional indicators. Um, and we were worried about some over uh, double counting, but uh, despite that, it does help to establish better this uh, this downturn, uh, which is in the Kodase dates. Um, so you do get a, a good depiction of the cycles, uh, and the dates dates match. Uh, so that's essentially what I wanted to share with you. Um, the business cycle indicator approach gives you this systematic framework to organize a lot of data and summarize it with composite indexes and helps to frame the discussion about what the business cycle looks like and how it evolves over time. So once you have these metrics, you can do historical comparisons. You know, how is this business cycle or growth cycle different from past cycles? And you can do inter-country uh, comparisons also. Uh, so look at issues like uh, uh, synchronization, convergence, divergence, or regional cycles, and so on. So thank you very much, and I think, I hope we have some time for questions. Yes, we do. So we'd be glad to take uh, a few questions. So in the uh, growth cycle stuff you were showing us, you were detrending using this HP yes. thing. So that, that's two-sided. What do you do? How do you get around that? Um, I, we don't. Um, so uh, I have a paper with Victor Zarnowitz in uh, JME that compares different trend estimation methods, uh, band pass filters, uh, local linear uh, trends. Um, and it turns out that if you pick the parameters, you can get uh, all of them to give you a very similar trend. Um, so, um, uh, so I'm just worried I, about the real time. I, 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 oh, that, that, that's, a, that's a good question, right. Um, I mean, I, 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 I can't tell you how sensitive it is for um, the growth cycle dates. That's one of the other reasons why we, we, we focus more on the business cycle. And the question um, is that there's always kind of this endpoint problem for um, any trend estimation uh, methodology. So that, um, so if you look at India, um, the detrended index shows a very sharp movement below trend at the end of the sample. So if India doesn't slow down as much as we think it's slowing down, or there's a very sharp recovery in the next couple of years, the trend is going to change, right? So there is sensitivity to that. Thanks for the question. But I don't have a good solution for it right now. Hello, I'm Marco Cavalcanti from IPEA. I wonder, uh, I couldn't understand, how do you select weights for each series uh, that compo makes up the, the, the index? Mm -hmm. Um, the components in this approach are essentially equally weighted. Um, so we don't have a, um, um, a way to estimate weights or um, assign subjective weights. 
but, there's a but, we go through this uh, volatility adjustment that I mentioned. And uh, that uses the inverse standard deviations for the components to normalize them. Um, so they act like, you know, weights or quasi weights when you're averaging them. Uh, but other than that, uh, there's not a major sort of source of um, estimation for weights or assignment for, for weights. Um, in the history of these indexes, uh, the BEA uh, had a methodology where they did assign weights. The, the weights came from a, a scoring method, method where you know, they would go through the selection process and based on the criteria they were using, uh, they developed these scores. Um, they dropped that, I believe, in 1989. Um, now, the comparison with the weighted and unweighted indexes showed that there was not a big advantage to, to the weighted uh, indexes. So you didn't lose anything. Um, and if you looked at the, the weights carefully, they were all very close to each other. And they were all very close to one. <laughs> so they weren't really doing much. Uh, because they've, the, index, the indicators have already gone through this pre-selection. Uh, so um, uh, I think that might be the reason why they're kind of behaving like that. So let's take one, one last question. So uh, in a recent uh, conference, I saw a lot of people using diffusion indices. And uh, of course, they give you a, a nice idea what's going on with the cross-section of uh, subsectors and things like this. So I was wondering whether you have used that and whether they work uh, for dating and... Um, I'm not aware of their use on dating. Um, that sounds funny, but um, diffusion indexes are, are uh, published in our press releases and in our databases. Uh, and I think they're very useful in understanding and interpreting the, these indexes. Um, what the indexes do is to give you an idea of the magnitude of the change the, the indicators are exhibiting. Um, the diffusion gives you the idea of you know, how widespread it is, um, so the proportion. And if they are above 50 percent, you know, a majority are rising, so you're, you're in clear water. But if it's below 50 percent, majority is falling. Um, So, my gut feeling is that um, these indexes might give you um, a more precise estimate of the turning point than diffusion indexes uh, because of the, the, the element of magnitude, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure about that. So, so we thanks uh, Mr. Rosildring.